Okay, now we're live. Welcome to Dive Into World Building. I am, I am your host, Juliet Wade, and today we're dressing up because Henry Lien has joined us to talk about his work. It's going to be a really fun time, and we've got Reggie in amazing glasses. Are those guitars, Reggie? They are guitars. How did you know? Awesome. And we've got our guest author, Henry Lien, in an awesome hat. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, so let's see. Uh, Henry, I'm gonna I'm gonna start by saying you're awesome. You are so much fun. I met Henry um, at the Nebulas, and we had a really nice chat. Um, and actually, I hadn't actually even read any of his work when I met him. And now that I've read some of his work, I think, boy, you know, you're a, you're you're a lot of fun. <laughs> um, he's been in Analog, and where else has your work appeared? Uh, uh, Asimov's, Asimov's. Uh, SF, uh, Lady Churchill's, Interfictions, that's it. Mm -hmm. Cool. And um, so I'm going to start by asking you about, uh, do you call it the world of Pearl? I do call it the world of Pearl. Okay, great. Tell us about the world of Pearl. <laughs> okay, the world of Pearl is a series of young adult fantasy, Asian fantasy, novel stories that I'm working on, and it is my primary project, and there are two novelettes in the world and a draft of a novel so far, and the primary defining features of the world are, uh, there are two things, the, the, the primary city in the world is also called Pearl, and it is made entirely of a substance that is called the Pearl, it looks like ice, but it is not cold and wet, it is warm and dry. And it allows people to skate on any surface in the city, any rooftop, any balustrade, any balcony, any handrail. So the city is always alive with people skating. And as a consequence, there are really no shoes and really no wheels in the city. All human and cargo transport is achieved by blade. Uh, that's the defining feature of the city. The, the secondary feature of the, of the world and the city is a sport that evolved from the material called wulu, and wulu is basically kung fu on figure skates. It's a form of um, um, athletics. It's a form of, of performance, and there is something called uh, Perlian opera, which is an opera except instead of singing, they have wulu, which is um, an, an, uh, a, a form of martial arts on figure skating. So uh, that's a lot of um, unusual concepts, and it, it probably is easier for me to just share a picture. This is the this is the painting from the cover of Asimov's with my first pearl novelette to give you an idea. So if you if you can see that, um, the the world is entirely white and entirely made of this this, this substance. The city is, not the entire world, I'm sorry, the, the, the city of Pearl. And as a consequence, you can skate on any surface, and um, the, the world is constantly alive with skaters. And uh, the art form combines the forms that we see from martial arts films, all the dazzling twirling and leaping um, and, and blocking and kicking, um, it merges that with analog forms from figure skating again, all of those dazzling leaps and, and turns um, into one art form that is both performance and can also be used as a deadly martial art. Hmm. So those are the defining features of the world of Pearl. So, so what was it? Um, I mean, every time I think of Kung Fu on ice skates, I just kind of have to smile. <laughs> I mean, it's just so out there and awesome. So I'm wondering what was it that caused these two concepts to crash together in your head? Do you, can you identify a point where that happened? Yeah, it was very deliberate. Um, when, I, when I started writing, I came to speculative fiction writing very late. And when I came to it, I realized I only want to, I don't, I'm, I'm 42 years old and I want to spend time on only things that only I could have written. And so I thought, well, what is what is the one book that I could never find on a shelf that has everything I like in one place? And, and go and write that. And so I said, well, what, what do I like right now? Um, 
Well, I like architecture. Uh, I like figure skating. I like kung fu, and I would like to have them all in one convenient place. So that's kind of uh, that was one of the one of the reasons why I created this world. And it sounds like a it sounds like a um, a very um, an intuitive way to create to, to world build. Um, you know, not building from any not building from any um, you know, economic force or any social uh, social strife that would normally uh, spawn a world from it. But really, it was it was I did a personal brain scan on what I liked, and I wrote. And uh, I kind of had to, um, I, I kind of had to retrofit the reality of the world and the believability of the world around that. And um, mm -hmm. and I was fine, I was fine with the idea that there was going to be an element of it that was incredibly uh, elegant and graceful and, um, and 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 noble and athletic and mm -hmm. powerful. But there was also going to be a part of it that was really corny and and tacky and and, and embarrassing. Um, and that is very true to my my experience of being Taiwanese uh, and and uh, and being part of the Chinese diaspora. There are things about contemporary and ancient, ancient uh, Taiwanese and Chinese culture that that are, I'm so proud of um, that that are awe inspiring. And there are parts of it that are that just make me cringe because they are so tacky. And I wanted to I, I wanted the world that I created to embrace both of those things. Um, and and to try to and try to Try to negotiate some sort of peace between them. You see it. You, you see this happen in in some um, in, in some popular culture uh, in from Asia. You see it a lot in the martial arts films, where they will take something that seems outrageous, um, you know, concubines that suddenly um, are, are flying around the room and wielding swords, and they manage to somehow negotiate um, a smooth transition between these elements that are very elegant and these elements that are very wacky. And I wanted to achieve that as well. So, so that's kind of how the world came together. Uh, and hmm. there were there were a couple of other things that I really wanted to achieve. Um, looking looking at children's literature as an adult, I was able to look at it with, um, with with certain sensitivities that I didn't have as a child. And one of them is just you know how 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 crappy girls and women have it in in uh, in literature generally. So I wanted to choose something um, that really made women the focus, women and girls the focus of the world. And so I chose a sport specifically to address the idea of the strong female character. And you know, that, that's a really complicated thing to deal with, the idea of the strong female character. Um, I think that a lot of people have differing ideas of about how to reach the same goal, which is to represent women in a way that is realistic, that in, a, in a way that is diverse and respectful, um, because we need we need realistic representations because we so often ask images to reflect reality. So we have to have the images be realistic. And uh, the question is how do we how do we achieve that? And so the idea of the strong female character is something that I played around with a lot. And I was dissatisfied with a lot of the knee jerk reactions that a strong female character necessarily has to be um, you know a wielding a, a, a battle axe um, and, and doing the exact same things as a male character would do. I just I thought that was just a, a, a not the most sophisticated way to approach the problem and may, may, for me not the most convincing way. So I specifically wanted to write um, something that focused on a sport where women and men, boys and girls, had uh, equal contributions, but very di different contrib contributions, and figure skating was one of them. Uh, not a lot of male skaters, no matter how strong or how talented, can do a quadruple jump, and that is something that a 13-year-old girl pioneered. Um, you know, little Tara Lipinski was able to do something that the greatest male skaters in the world could never do, and that was really interesting. Here was a sport where both the, the, the men and the women's achievements were equally valued by the world. I think it's probably the one sport that I can think of off, off the top of my head where the women's competitions achieve as much, if not greater, viewership from around the world as the men's. And, uh, and also the women's achievements capitalize on the ways that women are physically different. Um, they might not have the brute strength, but this is a sport that honored and, and, and rewarded not just brute strength. So there are things that a 13-year-old girl can do because she might not have the sheer muscle strength, but she has the flexibility, and she has the liveness, and she has the balance. And here was a sport where being small was an asset. 
So I wanted very much, oh, and, and this is actually very true of martial arts as well. As research for this series, I, um, I, I took figure skating lessons and I took kung fu lessons uh, just so I would know what I was talking about a little bit. And, okay, okay. Um, and when I um, when I started taking kung fu lessons, um, the class is very mixed. There was a, a young Asian woman; she was probably 18 years old. And when we would do one-on-one -on -one exercises, she would slaughter me. And it was not because of strength; it was because of flexibility. It was because of balance. Um, and that really taught me that this was a sport that rewarded different different um, different talents. And so that's part of why I realized that I needed to write about this. This, this served my purposes of um, representing women and girls in a way that was realistic without falling into some traps about um, depicting strong female characters. Um, anyway, this is supposed to be a question and answer. You've asked one question and all the rest of the time is going to be answered. So oh, all right. I'm cool with you, you just continuing on. <laughs> it's, it's fun for the first two hours. You'll get tired of it after the third hour. <laughs> Good thing we only have an hour then. <laughs> oh. uh, let's see. So, um, okay. Um, can you give us an example of uh, a favorite uh, female character that you have in one of, the, of your stories that would that would sort of exemplify the qualities that you're talking about? Um, I'm going to pick. I'm not going to pick my favorite character. I'm going to pick a character that is in something that has been published because my favorite character is in the first Pearl novel, but that is not that has not been released to the world yet. So, okay. My favorite character is, other than that, my favorite character is a character named Doi Liang from a novelette I wrote called Pearl Rehabilitative Colony for Ungrateful Daughters. And that was my that was my first publication. It was in the December two thousand and thirteen issue of Asimov's. And there, oh, that was the we just saw a picture of Doi. Um, let's see. Okay, Doi is the character in the foreground, um, with the short hair and the arm in a in in a sling and the sword. And what I loved about this character was that. Um, well, I wrote. Let me back up. I wrote this story at Clarion West, and my instructor was Chuck Palahniuk, whom I just worship. And I wanted to create something that was a sort of like a female fight club. So the premise of this story is that it takes place at um, uh, a sort of cram school penal colony called Pearl Rehabilitative Colony for Ungrateful Daughters, and it, it is a place that parents in the city would send their willful daughters. To to um, to get them um, to, to clean them up, um, teach them rigor and discipline, and prepare them for the examinations to get into one of the prestigious academies. And so it was a very insular environment. It was all female on female dynamics. And uh, because I was writing this for Chuck Palahniuk, and I was I had Fight Club in my mind as a sort of model. I looked at Fight Club, and and I and I asked myself, well, why is it so powerful? It wasn't powerful so much because of the plot, but I think it was powerful because it, look, it looked at some um, very primal male-on-male -male dynamics. And I wanted to flip that around and, to the best of my ability as a non-female, uh, study female-on-female -female dynamics. And one of the things that occurred to me is that because women are generally more relational than men, there is an impetus for um, any gathering of girls to immediately, or, or to, to very quickly try to form or decide what the relationships are between um, between the various girls in the room. So um, a new girl steps in the room, and many girls will want to decide: Well, is she going to be my new best friend, or my protege, or my rival, uh, or my mentor? Um, there is a strong social impetus to form a relationship with somebody rather than just being in the same room and having no relationship. Mm -hmm. um, that is that characterizes that characterizes the behavior of the villain in this novelette. Um, and my favorite character is Doi Liang who is the uh, I guess she's the heroine of the novelette. And she absolutely resists this um, this social 
impulse to form relationships. She just she wants to do her work. She wants to get in and get out of this colony um, with a good record. That's all she cares about. She's not here to make friends. She's not here to make enemies. And so because of this, she's <laughs> defying um, what I saw as um, the way that many girls are, are socialized um, to to interact with each other. Uh, she didn't want to participate in that. She just was not interested. She was perfectly fine with her own company and she was perfectly fine with doing her work. And that's why I love her. She was um, she was very much her own person. She was not going, going to be defined um, by, uh, the, by the conditioning that all the other girls around her were subjected to. So that's why I loved her. Mm -hmm. how, much of the, how much of this world it comes uh, directly from research on China in when you're working with it? Um, if I had to put a number on it, maybe maybe 40%. A lot of it is feeling. Um, I mean, I do a lot of research, but my approach is that I, I do extensive research, I do extensive outlining, and then I write a long encyclopedia of, uh, <laughs> of world building, and the encyclopedia for, for Pearl, it's, it's 120 pages maybe, um, all of the back history, all of the invented customs, and, uh, and a lot of that is inspired by research, by hard research, by uh, analogies from Chinese and Taiwanese and Japanese culture, but at some point when I feel that I have studied that encyclopedia sufficiently so that I have absorbed the world, my rule is to put it away and not refer to it while I write. Um, mm. So that that's the filter for me so that I am not going, I'm not falling into the trap of, of, of checking items off of a list that I want to include, um, make, making sure that I don't miss a darling in the actual writing process. And I find that that is a, that is a good way for me to write, only, not only because it filters out um, what is an important detail in the world building and what is not, but also it allows me to improvise. So I'll dimly remember that there was some um, there was some cultural tradition from actual Chinese um, folklore regarding not pointing at the moon, but I don't quite remember what the details were, and I just have the flavor of it in my mind, and that flavor is what I want to replicate, and in the process of trying to of trying to um, um, reverse engineer whatever that folklore was that produced that mm -hmm. maxim that one must never point at the moon, I end up spinning my own new folklore. And, and that's kind of how culture happens anyway. That's how folklore happens. Um, that's how mythology happens. So I'm kind of uh, in intentionally inducing that next, um, that, that next mutation of the tradition um, by only only dimly remembering it and not allowing me to refer to the notes. Um, so it ends up that less than a majority, maybe 40% of the actual material is directly derived from any, uh, any research or any actual tradition. And that's how I like it. Sure. Do you use, um, do you use Chinese language in the stories other than uh, the names? Uh, there are some puns that only exist that are only um, comprehensible to people that speak Chinese or Taiwanese, and I'm okay with that. Um, there are little Easter eggs, inside jokes um, for the translator someday. Um, but um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't use, um, I don't use a, a whole lot of things. I want to keep it very accessible mm -hmm. uh, because this is not. China. If I wanted to write about China, I would have called it China. Um, and and I wanted to create something that was um, Chinese inflected, but I have the liberty to make it my own thing. Um, again, I, if I wanted to make it China, I would have called it China. And one of the things that I um, that I encountered that was surprising was that I intentionally mixed Taiwanese, Ch Chinese, and Japanese elements, traditions, and names mm -hmm. uh, into the world. And uh, the, the, the readers that come from any of those cultures had zero problem with it. Nobody even mentioned it. But I did have a number of readers who were not from those cultures, who were from Western cultures, mm. for whom this just ground the story to a halt. And I think that they were very, they, they had very good intentions. They were trying to, um, to, to broadcast that they understand there is a difference and it, it is wrong to, um, to, to, uh, to um, 
um, not know that there is a difference, a vast difference between Chinese culture and Japanese culture. And I appreciate that. I absolutely appreciate that they that we have we as a nation have gotten there. We as a culture, Western Western um, a Western culture, have come to recognize that there is a vast difference between China and Japan. But I want to take it a step further and um, and say I am I am free to play with this if, because if you look at um, any epic Western fantasy, they will freely mix terms and traditions from from um, uh, from the British Isles, um, from uh, from um, Roman culture, from Norse culture, <coughs> and nobody questions that. They have the liberty yeah. to play um, and to mix and match. I want that liberty too. Do you think um, it's actually quite worth quite worthwhile? Well. Say that again. It's very worthwhile. Yeah, to play I, around. I, I think I think it's not it's it's worthwhile and it's also um, it, it also reflects the reality of many many countries and many cultures in the world. If you go to the Philippines, the Philippines is not a monolithic culture. There mm -hmm. are people who speak Tagalog. There are people that you know, there's a, there's a long uh, tradition of Spanish colonialism in there. Um, there are a lot of, ch of ethnic Chinese in in the Philippines. So the, the Phil Philippines is a polyglot culture. Um, Singapore as well, uh, Malaysia as well. They, they, these are not monolithic cultures. These are cultures that are used to their populations being diverse. They're used to their populations being multilingual. And so I wanted Pearl to be those things as well. Um, and that's why I deliberately chose to to uh, to use words and themes and traditions from Chinese, uh, Taiwanese, and Japanese culture. Very cool. So how much history do you have? I mean, I'm, I'm hearing about your encyclopedia. I'm curious. How much history have you put together for this place? Yeah, there's a lot, and it's and it's um it's fun. It's um it, it's tempting to use all of it because um some of them are are great little short stories in of themselves. I mean, some of them are, are two thousand word short stories. Um, and I have to be very careful again about um studying the novel with little darlings that don't need to be there. So there's a lot. Um, there's uh, there are songs um, from from the world of Pearl that I have written. Um, mm -hmm. There are um, there's a there's a whole food is very important. I mean I think food is very important in culture generally, um, but food is very important in the world of Pearl. Um, I think food can, conveys a lot of a lot of a culture's values. Um, its relationship to nature, its relationship to animals. Um, it's relationship. It's, it's ideas of medicine. They are all conveyed through food. So there is a lot of thought that I put into the food of Pearl. Some of which appears and is used in the novel, and much of which is not. So there's a lot, and um, I had to know that in order to to build the world. I um, I just didn't feel the the world is 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 so odd as it is. You know, being defined by kung fu and figure skating <coughs> that. I kind of felt that I needed to um, I needed to buy myself some some credibility by making the world richly imagined um, to take it out of mere wackiness and mere novelty and make it something that had uh, a, a, a bit of heft and, and believability. So there is a lot in the world, and I, I I'd love to use it all. I probably will never get to use it all, um, but I'd, I'd love to. I'd love to visit this place. It's it's got um it's got really interesting interesting traditions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Glenda says uh Ooh, look at all that. I missed all that. Iceberg theory. <laughs> well, you think do you do you think it's only ten percent, Glenda, that should appear in the story of what the author knows? Well, that's a pull a number out of the air, but <laughs> to illustrate a small fraction. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. It, it, um, it ends up it ends up being uh, an exercise in poetry almost. How do you convey an entire cuisine? How do you convey an entire uh, um, a poetic tradition in one little reference? Um, so it ends up being uh, an exercise for the writer, but it ends up being an exercise for the reader. And I think that William Gibson is probably a master of this. He will make some <clears throat> he will make some you know off the cuff. Um, comment to something like meat puppets in Neuromancer, and you, you think, well, what are meat puppets? And only later on do you realize from context that it is this whole 
new industry of, um, of, of uh, prostitution where the prostitutes, because they don't want to experience being a prostitute, they take these drugs to knock themselves out so that they are um, unconscious during, um, during the actual sex act. And that's all conveyed by two words, meat puppets. And so it ends up being a sleuthing game for the reader as well. You're trying to piece out from, from the from the um, from the context of what this means in the world. So ten percent might be might be generous actually. It might be more like two percent. <laughs> <laughs> All <Yeah>. right. <laughs> it's yeah. I mean because well, I mean I think that you're right about the amount that can be implied. Um, we have a lot of things that just sort of come with phrases that we use, so it makes sense that there would be a lot of things that would come along with phrases that somebody uses, uses in, a, in a secondary way. Um, do you find yourself having to teach particular items as you're writing? Yeah, you know, that's a really, that's a really big problem, I think, with any world building. How, how, um, how dumb do you dumb it down? And, uh, and it's very hard when, when, you're, when you're the creator of the world and you ask ten different people, they'll give you ten different ideas of how explicit you need to be. Um, for a long time I was working under a rule that one of my Clarion West instructors taught me. Connie Willis said that if you want people to remember a new idea, you've got to say it three times before they're going to get it. And I, th I, I think that there's a lot of wisdom to that and I kind of worked with that um, assumption and so um, I would make reference to every new cultural tradition that I injected into the world at least three times. And then I then I um, I, I had to have this novel run the gauntlet that was um, that, that my um, agent and uh, editor represented, and they slashed slashed down to one reference. They said just trust trust your readers a whole lot more than you're doing now. They will figure it out. Um, they will be motivated to figure it out because there's enough of a plot there that even if they aren't getting everything on the first pass, this story is built to be read more than once. And that's that. Uh, I'm still fighting with that. Um, I, I don't want to be. Um, I don't want to be a bad host, and that's how I feel when I um, when I make um, references that are baffling in my writing. Because I'm um, I'm asking. I feel like I'm asking readers a lot as it is to accept this wacky world, and so I don't want to be a bad host and be inattentive to their confusion. Um, so I'm still wrestling with that. I'm still struggling with cutting out those se second and third repetitions of the same thing. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I mean, I, I know I know about the rule of, the rule of three and it's a real, generally a very good guideline, but it's, I think it also depends on how much focus the, el the element is getting in the story. If the entire plot hinges on it, you probably want to have people understand it pretty well. <laughs> but if it's, a, if it's something that's going to go by and be I guess, I don't know, local color, texture, sort of an added dimension, then you can kind of leave it alone and let people uh, work for you in a way. Yeah, I think they're all important, though. <laughs> That's the problem. Yeah, yeah, I know it's true. It's true. Interesting. All right, so um, do you want to tell us a little bit about the details of the food culture in Pearl that you come up with? Yeah, um, one of the one of the things that strikes me, I'm I'm vegan, and coming from um, Taiwanese culture, I'm, you're really struck by how uh, there is so much variety in Taiwanese and Chinese cuisine as it is. Uh, if you look at the variety of spices and and the variety of sauces, it seems like there is. If you had to, if you had to only choose, if you had to only eat Chinese cuisine for the rest of your life. Um, could not you would not complain because there is such a variety of flavor uh, flavors to experience purely from sauces and spices. But one of the things that that I notice is that there is this fascination with exotic meats. Um, there is an animal called the pangolin, and the pangolin is an armadillo-like animal. Um, it's supposed to taste terrible. It's supposed to taste like rat. Um, these Korean people have eaten rat. Um, and on top of that, it's an endangered species. So those are two reasons not to eat it. But it is considered one of the most uh, prestigious delicacies in Chinese cuisine. Um, 
those are terrible reasons to eat something. Um, it, it tastes like rat, and it's also an endangered species. <laughs> but um, but people are drawn to that in in Chinese and Taiwanese cuisine, and so that's something that I look at very hard in in Pearl. Um, I, I look at this um, at the idea of um, uh, people exoticizing different types of animals purely because they are rare. Um, and, um, and and wanting to, to eat them and incorporate them purely for the novelty of it. I mean, I think the novelty is an element that I look at in food. Um, I, 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 I like the idea of food history and um, the idea of dishes, be, some dishes being ancient and some dishes be, being very contemporary. And so mm -hmm. I, I play with that in Pearl. Um, there is a great tsunami that hits the island of Pearl right before the beginning of the first novel. And um, because of the way that Pearl is built, they can kind of blow off tsunamis. Um, the, the Pearl is a very resilient, very durable substance so that it, there is no structural damage from the tsunami. As long as people have warning, they are able to get to safety and there is no damage to the city. So they are very uh, cavalier about tsunamis. And a great tsunami hits the city of Pearl shortly before the novel begins. And the first response of the people of Pearl is, oh, that is, that is fantastic, because now all these rare creatures from the bottom of the sea will wash up on the shores, and <laughs> the culinary experts of Pearl can get out there and turn them into dishes before the scientists can reach them and, ex and, and study them. Um, so there is a great banquet at the beginning of the school year at this academy called Pearl Opera Academy, and they welcome the first year students with something called the Osmanthus Banquet. And um, they are very fortunate because this year's Osmanthus, Osmanthus Banquet is, is composed entirely of dishes made from creatures washed ashore by the tsunami, some of which don't even have proper names yet. Um, that seemed to me, uh, that, that, that was true to my experience of growing up Taiwanese and having my parents um, put in front of me things that were um, very exotic, very strange, uh, and the more exotic and, and the stranger they were, uh, the more of a delicacy they were considered. Uh, that seemed strange to me as a child, <coughs> as a child, and certainly as a vegan now, that seems strange to me. So I'm able to, I think I'm able to experience the the, the food culture from Taiwan as both an insider and an outsider, and and I try to convey that mm -hmm. with this this horrific opening banquet where these students who are not from Pearl are subjected to one um, tsunami-born exotic sea creature after another that they have to try to eat. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm imagining it. Um, I had a, I as oddly, I had a, an appalling experience that is a lot like that when I was in Japan, Henry. I was, oh. I was encouraged to eat a, a spread made from whale. Uh, uh. And I just looked at it and kind of went, you're kidding me, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, but there was a lot of social pressure around that situation, yeah. too. So. Yeah. Um, and that's an interesting example. The eating of cetaceans, the killing and eating of cetaceans in Japan is very loaded. I wrote, I wrote about this in another story of mine. There was in a magazine of fantasy and science fiction uh, called Bilingual, and it was about the tradition of killing dolphins in Tai Chi, Japan, every year. Um, and uh, it is so controversial, and it is so deeply upsetting for most of the world. It does not represent that much economically to the villages in Japan that practice this, but they cling to it and they fight to it so fiercely because. The opposition to it has made it into um, made it into a symbol of their culture for them. They defend mm -hmm. it on cultural grounds, even if it represents so little to their diet, even if it represents so little to their traditions. Because we have criticized it, it is now for them a focal point of their traditions. Um, so, I mean, that is very complex, very very complicated to have another culture come in and say this what you are doing is evil it is deeply evil and is indefensible and will be uh, will be seen very differently by history in 50 years it's very different for for people within that community to say that um, than it is for somebody from the outside to come in and say that so so yeah there is a lot of um, there is a lot of emotion about the eating of whales and dolphins in Japan that's something I look at in the world of pearl as well how we how people cling to traditions um, because we are tired of being attacked, and they might they might be very very bad traditions, but we cling to them stubbornly because we're we want to make a statement with it. 
Um, that is something that cultures do that um, that I think is interesting, bad but interesting. It's something something that I look at in the world of Pearl. Yeah. Um, uh, Reggie, are you saying that you have to go soon? Oh no, I just my uh my dog is going now. But um no, the uh, I just can't live tweet right now. Oh okay, I just wanted to check in. I didn't know whether you were saying you couldn't live tweet because you couldn't live tweet or because you had to leave. <laughs> oh no, I'm good. Just wanting to check. No worries. Um. Okay, I'm finishing writing my notes. <laughs> I can tell I'm going to have lots of writing to do about you, Henry. <laughs> oh, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an analysis after this. Do I get graded? No, what I do is I take now I take notes, and then I uh, then I write a little summary report and I put it up on my blog. Oh, okay. Because not everybody has the ability to go in and watch an hour of video, basically. I see. Um, so people who want to get content, you know, quality content, the the insights of author Henry Lien, right? <laughs> wow. And they don't have an hour to sit down. They can skim over the report and, and get some good ideas. So, yeah. It's uh, kind of my, my, my contribution to the whole thing. Right. Um, so let's see. Um... What about questions from uh, what about questions from other folks in the group? I had one and it's gone now. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it it had I'm, I'm trying to retrace my thought process. It had to do with that um, when you were talking about that uh, moment of the kind of cultural digging in about something that's been. Uh, criticized by an external culture. Mm -hmm. um, I had a question about that, but I can't remember how it was framed in my head. Maybe I could just ask you to talk a little more about that? Is that... I'm usually better at this. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I can talk about it. There, I mean, there are... There are uh, let me back up a little bit. So Taiwan is... is um, Taiwan has had an interesting history because in my just my parents in, in my parents lifetime my parents are still living in my parents lifetime they went from basically almost like a, a almost like a feudal system to Japanese rule um, to American military rule to a democracy a full-fledged democracy I mean that is a a huge arc um, in in one century and my grand my grandmother had bound feet um, was mm -hmm. illiterate and had bound feet. I saw them once, um, and um, there are uh, there are a lot of things that cultures will cling to when they are asked to change very quickly. When they when they collide against other cultures, um, um, you know, when when my when my grandmother was young, I mean, she she didn't have any idea that there were these magical things like in television and airplanes. That was that was completely out of her. Realm of reality, and um, and when when a, an entire culture is forced to leap a century forward because of military conquest or because of whatever reason, um, there is a lot of resistance. Uh, the 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 tr the tradition of foot binding, um, the communists the co communists were able to end it on mass because they were able to do many things on mass. Um, but in other parts of the Chinese speaking, the the the, 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 um, the Chinese diaspora, like in Taiwan, where the communists weren't able to come down with you know with an edict and say we are going to end this now across the board, um, those traditions lingered as un as indefensible as they are. They lingered, um, and this was not a and this foot binding. That was not a case of uh, an outside power coming in and saying you must stop this. Uh, that was a case of. Um, of uh, internal forces saying this is so, this is so heartbreaking and absolutely um, medieval and primitive. We must stop this. And still, there was resistance to it for decades. Um, so, imagine how much harder it is when some person who has come and they, they they have bombed your, they have bombed your country. My my mother's house was bombed by Americans, um, and. Um, and so imagine when somebody comes in and says, okay, we, we bombed your country, we've taken over control of your government, and now you, these, here, are these, here are these traditions that you must give up. Um, 
you can imagine that there's going to be resistance mm -hmm. to that out of sheer pride, even if they are terrible traditions that really should be abandoned. Um, so I mean, we see that a lot yeah. as as the world as as the world is constantly interacting with each other and abrading each other in ways that it hasn't historically. You see that so much. You see that you see this with with the, the issue of uh, female uh, genital mutilation, um, which is so incredibly uh, indefensible and 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 infuriating. But you see the resistance based on the same dynamic. So that was something that I looked at in Pearl in in a much less uh, incendiary way because this is meant to ultimately, ultimately be a hopeful um, story. Uh, I do look at things that are um, th th that are maybe a, a little um, 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 a little fluffier, uh, such as the the the, um, the eating of really disgusting things, and how people will cling to that out of sheer stubbornness because when your culture is attacked, you want to cling to any vestige of the culture. So maybe somewhere in there that was the answer to your question. I think that last line summed it up beautifully. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated by looking at cultures that are the result of multiple layers of conquest. Yeah. And it, it's, I think it makes for a really rich culture. I do too. I, I think that the idea of having to negotiate your own identity uh, with between various poles or I mean, they might not even not even be binary if the culture has been colonized by a number of people and there is um, and, and the, and the uh, there are different um, racial components in the population having to, to figure out where you are um, that's that's difficult but it's also a really important life experience uh, at some point we all have to make our decisions and realize that identity is not necessarily a sign identity is a choice to some extent um, and when an entire culture is thrust into making that decision that's really interesting there are pressures in, in such cultures that are absent in other cultures where um, where race uh, nationality language um, um, genetic makeup are all uniform. So yeah, I like looking at those places where um, there are these collisions between populations and there are these stresses because they can produce really, really beautiful reactions. Yeah. Um, I have a question. <laughs> um, you've described the world of Pearl as being a young adult uh, world, but I know that young adult actually covers a great deal of ground. Um, do you delve into questions of sexuality as well as gender within this context? Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in a big way, but I don't. But, know. <laughs> this, I, but I, I don't. I, I'm not going to say anymore because um, it's it's part of the secret of the first book. Okay. Uh, it is a huge. It is a huge part of the first book, um, but that is meant to be. A, you're not meant to know that until deep into the book. I can't talk about it anymore. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Don't say anymore. To answer answer your question. <laughs> what? I didn't mean to pry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, to answer your question generally, I, I, um, I, um, I think the sexuality, um, sexual identity, those are those are those are important questions in every culture. And mm -hmm. so by building, if I'm building a convincing culture, I, I had to address those issues. Uh, how do I? How do people? How do people um, construct themselves? In terms of gender, how do people construct themselves in terms of sexuality? Uh, what are the dynamics in this culture? What is happening? Where are they in their um, enlightenment or their march to progress? Those are important questions to ask of every culture in world building. So yeah, those questions uh, would have entered into the building of the world of Pearl, but they entered in a very specific plot way that you've just ruined. Thanks. <laughs> no problem. I don't, I don't really think I've ruined anything, so <laughs> I think we'll all be more curious at this point than we were before, which is probably what you wanted in the first place. <laughs> so, awesome. Um, and I agree that those are important questions. <laughs> so, that I, I kind of saw them peeking up in some of the things that we'd already talked about during the hour, so I guess that was why, uh, that was why I asked. So, 
You're, um, you're, you're right. You, you, you were on the right scent. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, more questions? We should be cognizant of the time if we want to adhere to the one hour limit because I do have a special surprise just for you. Okay. Uh, it will take about, it'll just take a couple of minutes, but let's leave some time for that at the end. Okay, so why don't we take some questions and then we'll do the surprise and then we'll wrap up. So I'm going to open it up to everybody, say, okay, last minute thoughts, anybody? Okay, here's one. Just I um, so with world building, when you approach any new project or any new world that you're creating, what is probably um, what's the first sort of area that you attack, or is it just kind of um, whatever hits you first? Do you have like a specific thing? That's a really good question. Um, I, I wouldn't. This is not the first thing that I think of, but it ends up being the last thing that I, that I think of, and that is money. Follow the money. Um, one of my clearing West. Instructors was George R. R. Martin, and he he said that money is, money ends up informing most of what he writes. Um, the way that he put it was that if if pigs could fly, bacon would become very expensive, and um, and he saw that he think, he sees this as a, as a weakness in a lot of fantasy world building that the, the economics don't make sense. People will um, create some um, some some cultural practice or um, some plot point that just does not make sense economically. And so following the money ends up being not the first question, but the last question, and one of the most important questions that I apply to any world building. I might approach it the way that I did like with the, with the world of Pearl Watt, where I, where I world build based on very um, specific indulgences. I'm writing about specific things that I'm interested in, but uh, before I can call the world building um, convincing, the economics of it have to make sense because like like with with sexuality money money pervades everything uh, money motivates everything money constructs so much of our world and um, and and that's why it's in integral to world building I mean look at this this ends up money ends up being very integral to the pearl novels um, money ends up being very integral to a, a lot of the things that, that are right outside of the world of pearl so that ends up being something that I have to look at and it's not necessarily the the sexiest part of the world building, but it ends up spawning its own world building of its own because you realize that um, when sources, resources are limited and there is a zero-sum um, equation that that explains a lot of behaviors um, between cultures. So money ends up being really important to world building. Very cool. Yeah, I, I agree. That's a, really, that's a really basic core principle that, uh, that you don't want to um, neglect. And just to self-advertise a little bit, if you go back into my archives, we actually have several discussions on economics and money and um, trade and various kinds of topics. So, so if you're interested in seeing what we talked about when we talked about those things, um, you have hours of enjoyment ahead. <laughs> uh, Henry, I, I'm going to say thank you for joining us, and um, if you want to do your surprise, now would be a good time. I very much want to do my surprise. Okay, so um, as you probably all know, there's an orga organization called CIFWA, the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America, and uh, they are my guild and probably the guild of, of many of you as well. And I am working on a secret project for CIFWA. This is not public yet. You are the first people in the known universe to know about this. And okay, so hang tight for a second. Henry, before we let loose, yeah. do I need to stop the broadcast? Because this no. gets recorded and goes on YouTube. Are you ready for it to go public? I'm ready for it, yes. yes. Okay, I'm just checking. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, I, I, I've, I've, talked, I've talked with somebody from CIFWA, and it is okay. Um, I am working on a recruitment anthem for CIFWA. And it is going to be um, a, a sort of a, a disco, um, a space disco glam song, uh, and it, it is a, it is, it is going to be um, a, a tongue-in-cheek recruitment anthem in in the vein of the village people's in the Navy, um, which was also um, a, a faux recruitment anthem for the Navy. And um, it, it will incorporate um, it will incorporate an, an element of audience participation 
with um, people spelling out the letters S F W A with their bodies, <laughs> and it'll be performed at the Nebula ceremony in two thousand in May two thousand sixteen in Chicago. <laughs> so I'm working on this now, working on this right now. Um, and I've just finished the melody, and uh, and I have the words for the chorus. So I would like to share that with you, I'd like to play that with you. I play that for you, and you will be the first persons ever to see this. Okay. Yay. Huh? Oh, hang on. I don't think I've ever been to a world premiere before. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> I'll have something fun to talk about on my radio show on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is going to sound very different from uh, the final product uh, because, as I said, it's going to be a space disco song, but this is just the melody on the piano and, um, and, and me uh, singing the words of the chorus. But this is called Radio Sithwa. I need I need people to perform it with me at the um, 2016 Nebula ceremony. Oh, um, Juliet! What? It's a Juliet. She's got really? to you, Will you be there? Because I mean, I really I really need people to perform it with me because um, three people at least three people perform me and it looks cool and it's kick ass. One person performed me and looks like a weirdo up on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> at least a couple oh people perform me. Yeah, talk to me, Henry. Totally. Yeah. I, I have to. I have to make sure that I can uh, line up the line up the travel, but I can probably do it. All right. Uh, it's like it's one of those things that I consider on my list of plans for next year. So. 
Yep. Okay. I, I would love I would love for you to help me out. That's awesome. So um thank you. <laughs> wow, what a treat. And <laughs> and um I cannot remember what I had on my list for topic for next week. <laughs> that's okay. I think my brain is still going, Brady, I'm so <laughs> 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 um, uh, But we will meet uh, at the same time, uh, 3 o'clock next week, and uh, hopefully I'll be on Twitter and on Facebook letting people know what the topic's going to be. Thank you all for coming. Now, the last thing to end, if I may, um, not to hijack your, your standard ending, but um, in, in Pearl, we're talking about traditions, and Pearl has a very specific way to say goodbye. And goodbye is expressed as a pair of blessings between both sides of the departure. So one side says, may we meet here in the new year, and the other side says, may we meet here in Pearl. So, may we meet here in the new year. May we meet here in Pearl. Pearl. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, Morgan, you want to do education? Sure. It's yeah. on the list somewhere. Yeah, I know. I, let's see. Okay, let me look one last second and see if I can figure out what I had on my list because I know I had things on my list. Oh, yeah. So, um... Well, let's let's get let, give you guys an option. What would you like? Idioms, titles and surnames, or neurotypicality? Oh, that's We will do all them all. Pick. Now, this is terrible. Uh the the neurotypical one. Let's do the neurotypical one. Okay, yeah. We'll talk about people who are neurotypical and people who are not neurotypical and how that works in, in world building. That sounds like a great idea. And then we'll do the other things, too, because, you know, we just keep going with this stuff. Yay! Sounds great. So we'll be back, and um, keep track of us on Twitter, Henry. You are welcome to return any time that you feel like engaging on a topic. And if you have a title, like if you have, like, something particular you want to brainstorm about with people, uh, let me know. We can make it into a topic. So... <laughs> That offer is open for anybody here, so let me know. Alrighty, thank you all for coming. I'm going to stop the broadcast.